my name is Elias. I run a YouTube channel called Native Media Theory. <laughs> oh, cool. Dude, Hi. So excited to meet you, man. I am yeah. I am so thrilled. Yeah, likewise. I was really excited when you reached out. I actually I was watching Elvis and then I got out and I saw your message and I was like, oh no, I was freaking out. Oh, um, but thanks, thanks for reaching out, man. Um, so yeah, Jane, my name's Elias. Uh, I'm Dene. I grew up in Shiprock. Uh, and I got my film degree and I figured, you know what, I might as well talk about natives and films. So fabulous. Um, Where so do you live? Right now I live in Utah. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. So, um, pretty close to Sundance. That's um, good. so I, I guess Jane, I actually have some really weird specific questions for you that really piqued my interest in watching this film. Sure. I just want I just wanted to know is Orange Tutsia is that based on a real thing or was that specifically made for this film in particular because that that, <laughs> that whole thing I thought was very fascinating to me. Yes, it's kind of um a mixture of both. Okay. You know because you know as native people there are certain things we can't just give away, right? But Tutsia is a flower. So that 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 is Tutsia means flower. So that yeah. you know that's just orange flower. So uh Yes. So it was kind of a, a melding of, of two things. Great. Now, uh, I just, I thought that was so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, just knowing the certain, the certain things that they do to you. And then I thought that was just a fascinating indigenous insert and in how it actually contributed to the story, which I thought was really cool. Absolutely. And the other, the other question I have is what is Mupitsil? Mupitsil. Mupits. Mupits. Mupits, yeah. Mupits. Tia Mupits uh, means big monster. Mupits is our uh, monster that's in our all of our children's stories, you know, and then we tell them, you know, oh, shh, quiet, or the Mupits is going to hear you, or you better behave, or the Mupits is going to come. So, um, okay. um, so like the Mupits, when he's described, it's actually describing a being like the predator. Nice. It's that, like that. the tall, huge thing that comes out at night, has small eyes, can barely see and eats children so there you go that's like the perfect thing i love i loved that about that i thought that was really cool yeah. and unless, like, the last little thing i thought was uh very interesting to bring about because you know i recently uh the history of the comanche has especially with um uh i think it was the the M the empire of the summer moon book that came out uh i've read it uh i didn't particularly enjoy it <laughs> that's just me though uh, because it had a lot of Eurocentric um, viewpoints about uh, your tribe. And I, I was just curious, though, more specifically about the, I guess, the choreography and a lot of the, the, the a lot of the specific things, it's particularly with fight choreography, because that's been something that's been studied by a lot by lots of Western um, Western uh, people. And I was I was wondering if there if you came in and had any specific, uh, you know, viewpoints on how uh, to, to, to incorporate certain indigenous and specifically Comanche elements into the fight choreography and movements and specific stuff like that. I was, that was one of the things that piqued my interest. Yes, uh, sure. I had some just growing up Comanche and growing up shooting. I mean, that's how we hunted. We shot bows and arrows because nobody could afford guns and stuff yet. So, you know, we, we had, you know, knives and bows and arrows, uh, but we had a really uh, good person that we hired, Kevin Star Blanket. That is Dan. You want to tell a little bit more of Kevin's background, being tactical and yeah. I mean, Ke Ke Kevin's First Nation and and um, and uh, 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 was in the military, law enforcement, and a survivalist. Um, so you know, because the history of the Comanche is so oral, as and it's in the 1700s. There was only, there's a limit to where research could go. And it's funny, even, even you mentioning that book, I really avoided it. Um, Thank you. Because I, I think I started reading it and then I read a little bit more about the author and was like, oh, this is, this is coming from perspective. This isn't coming from the source. Um, and it's, it's one of the instincts to eventually when I found Jane and even uh, we had a, a consultant on prior who, who since passed away, Juanita Pataponi, um, who advised on the script when we initially wrote it. Um, but I, you know, was anxious to because because though we had historians as well, the research can only go so far, and felt like what we needed to hear is the not only just the oral traditions that have been carried on that Jane knows from her elders and her 
um, family members and, and what everyone just sort of has felt from growing up that way. Um, but then people's imagination and my imagination um, is not the same as Kevin Starblankets with his background and Jean's with her background to think about um, how would they have fought in that time? Um, how would they have moved through the woods in that time? And, um, and all of those kinds of things. So um, we infused all of that stuff um, with uh, you know, our, what our stunt coordinator brought to the table and our fight choreographer brought to the table um, so that it could feel super exciting and, and, and still have you know, an authenticity. So you know, I, I'm obsessed with Hong Kong action movies, martial arts movies growing up and really wanted to deliver on a hand-to-hand -hand sequence with Nadu versus those fur trappers. Um, but I knew that she could not be using martial arts. That does not exist. So um, finding a way in which she could throw down um, that would feel authentic to her, um, to the Comanche, um, but also and, and, and um, but also feel exciting was where I was going. What you mentioned too, like I think the very first draft of the script, not very first draft, but when, when when Jane first read the script, it didn't have horses in it. And Jane, just to speak speak for you, sorry, That's you okay. were very insistent. Jane was very insistent, like as we all know, Lords of the Plains, horse culture, like you gotta have horses in it. But the the script just has so much in the woods and on a river and then, you know in places where there would not be, you know, the a great horse back sequence. Um. So, but but from then we took inspiration and choreographed that awesome um, piece with Tabe versus the Predator, um, just so we could honor um, what would be the most true to Comanche. And then just to say one more thing about what Jane often spoke about um, and what we can know when we read about the Comanche is just how innovative they were um, in the way that they hunted. Um, so though we didn't see them you know, using the pincer movement to, to trap buffalo on screen, we just took that spiritually, that essence. And when Nadu develops her tomahawk, um, her very specific way of using it, not only is that a character thing of her bucking the trend and tradition, um, but it's also spiritually very Comanche to be innovative with um, her tools and her weaponry and her fighting. Yeah, and along with that uh, adaptability, we also had them use uh, sign language because Comanches use sign language quite a bit because we were, we covered such a vast amount of, you know, who could know all of those languages, right? The average Comanche knew like five plus languages, but when those languages weren't um, available, we had to use sign language. So we infused Comanche sign language, which the original, uh, what is it called? American Sign Language, ASL sign language uh, was developed. If you go back to its uh, original thing, it was developed off of Comanche trade sign language. So um, we did that with uh, Kevin's tactical language. So all of our, uh, all of our, when our warriors were in their boot camp, they could all speak to each other and they started all learning the language and they would use it, you know, throughout the day when they were off on weekends, when they'd head down to the river, you know, they would use, be using their language that was developed, which is, I think is really cool. No, that's, that's really amazing. I, I actually really appreciate that, especially for you, Jane. Like I, I have always been, you know, a stickler for native representation ever since I was a kid. You know, I, I've noticed these things in, in movies. Um, and I guess uh, for you, Dan, I have an odd question, but I guess, you know, I notice a lot of good directors tend to have set rules for themselves. And what, maybe what rules did you set for yourself in making this film? Like what, what rules did you set up for yourself that kind of helped this film become what it what it was or a, as close to your vision as it was that's a, I'm, I'm pretty curious about that that's a absolutely phenomenal question i think about that a lot too um and watching other filmmakers work uh and certainly was a big part of uh the 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 first movie i made tinkle of lane there was a giant uh rule set placed in front of me um with uh the location that it was set and, and the big thing, the, the, one of the reasons why I sought after making this movie was to really challenge myself and see if I could do the same thing. Um, so, you know, n now I will say never again will I make a movie that says exterior forest day the entire time. It's so daunting um, trying to find um, 
uh, you know, all the locations when it just is forest, you know, but that's where rule sets come into play. You constantly say to yourself over and over again. So I guess I'm answering your question by not saying there was one holistic rule set, but individual moments from scene to scene, thinking about, well, this is what the narrative needs. This is what it's saying about her and what she's going through. So this is the kind of location that we want to find. Um, so it was constantly moment to moment, like, how do I, because the, the world is your oyster. We're going outside. Like it can be anything. It can look like anything. Um, and always trying to find um, uh, the right kind of location felt like it was matching where she was in her story. Um, yeah. Well, I, I appreciate that. Out of all the films in the franchise, this one I think just had the most heart. And I really appreciated that. And I, I, I just feel so happy that it's with, you know, indigenous characters and indigenous cast and everything. So, uh, Dan, I and you, Jane, especially too. Um, I would love to talk to you guys uh, again down the road. And um, uh, I wish I had more time, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I I really appreciate you guys and the efforts you've put into this. This is a huge step in the right direction uh, for native representation. And I told I told Amber and uh, Dakota this, but like this is history for our people, for Absolutely. as a whole especially for the Comanche tribe is being, you know, having that dub in Comanche is like such a big deal. And uh, I, I, I just want to, I shout out to the rooftop. So like, this is a big thing, you know, and Thank you. I really, I really appreciate both of you for having the passion for story and for culture. So um, that's all I have left to say, but I hope to talk to you guys soon and again sometime. Feel free to reach out anytime, dude. Feel free. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. We'll awesome. see you guys later. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.